Okay, and then uh, I'm Dr. Matulo. I'm here to round out the discussion with carpal injuries and distal radius fractures with complications with scaphoid and carpal injuries. A uh, few disclosures. So the purpose of this talk is that while distal radius fractures tend to get a lot of attention, they tend to be the fracture that most of us like to try to fix. Uh, and Dr. Thoder has presented that more of us are fixing as, as time has gone on. There are other bones in the wrist, and they do get injured from time to time. So we should know that they don't all just get treated in a cast, and they don't all heal perfectly with unlimited freedom of motion. The purpose of this talk is basically uh, to discuss the fact that most non or minimally displaced carpal fractures tend to be treated conservatively. However, some of these fractures are not able to be visualized well through standard radiographs, and a good example of that is your handmade hook fracture. We want to discuss all eight carpal bones, and then with each carpal bone, we want to discuss the complications associated with missed or improper treatment of these fractures and what they can lead to down the road. Scaphoid fractures, if we look at carpal bone fractures, are the most commonly fractured wrist bone. They have an oblique orientation, which leads to compressive forces across the bone and tends to lead to fractures of these bones. And due to their oblique nature, they tend to need to be visualized slightly differently since they sit off axis to the standard 90-90 x-rays that we take. The typical interscaphoid angle, so if we take a line down the mid portion of the distal pole of the scaphoid and up the proximal pole of the scaphoid, can be accepted up to 35 degrees. But certain fractures of the scaphoid will cause continued flexion of the scaphoid or a humpback deformity. And we'll notice that uh, on the next slide or two. And we're going to see interscaphoid angles increase above 35 degrees. And the problem with the scaphoid, like a few other bones, like the lunate or the talus, is that the blood supply is more robust distally. And that compromises potential blood supply to the proximal pole with certain fractures that are either displaced or towards the proximal side of that scaphoid. With scaphoid fractures, conservative management may take time. And the more proximal the fracture, the longer it takes. Typically, these distal pole fractures can heal in six to eight weeks, but waist fractures can take up to three months. And proximal pole fractures can take up to six months with conservative management. Six months of immobilization in a cast obviously causes stiffness, decreased strength, disuse, osteopenia, and more time off work, particularly in your heavy laborers. Malunion with scaphoid fractures is also quite possible typically associated with a humpback deformity, and that's your inner scaphoid angle greater than 35 degrees. However, this results in a relative extension of the proximal pole. And because the proximal pole is tightly bound to the lunate through the scaphalunate interosseous ligament complex, it's going to cause that lunate to start to rotate distally. And that, rotate, or that results in a DC deformity with extension of the lunate uh, and extension of the triquetrum. That's going to change the range of motion of your midcarpal joint and of your wrist, and with time can progress to arthritic change within the midcarpal and radiocarpal joints. Nonunion of the scaphoid is certainly uh, a problem, particularly with displaced fractures, and these are typically your waist fractures with more than one millimeter of displacement. If your inner scaphoid angulation changes by 15 degrees compared to the contralateral side, or is greater than 35 degrees in general, that is a flexion uh, problem that increases your risk of nonunion. This can again lead to a DC deformity and then post traumatic change called snack wrist or scaphoid nonunion advanced collapse, which starts with arthritis at the distal pole of the scaphoid between that and the radial styloid, progresses to the midcarpal joint, and then eventually pancarpal arthritis. The problem with non-unions is they have varied success rates with operative repair, anywhere from 50 to 95 percent, depending on the literature that you read and the technique that you employ. So we should try to get these right the first time. A vascular necrosis is certainly something that we need to be concerned with, and they're more common with proximal pole fractures. This can lead to fragmentation of the proximal segment and eventual arthritic change. Well, what about lunate fractures? Well, the dorsal radial fractures uh, of the lunate they are typically associated with scaphalunate interosseous ligament uh, incompetence and can lead to DC deformity. Where your, co your, uh, your contrast or your other side, your volar ulnar fractures, typically rip off that critical volar portion of your lunar triquetral ligament, and that can associate itself with a VC deformity and, again, altered midcarpal mechanics. Proximal pole fractures of the lunate can yield avascular necrosis, and this is one of those debated topics as we search for the ever-present cause of Keenbox disease and whether or not potential undiagnosed or untreated fractures of the lunate may have some cause of what Keenbox may come from. 
Triquetral fractures of the, uh, of the wrist typically uh, associate themselves with these dorsal lip fractures. That's that little fleck that we see on lateral radiographs, and that's an avulsion of the ligamentous complex. If it doesn't unite or it's widely displaced, that can lead to pain and non-union. Triquetral body fractures are typically the result of axial loads through the wrist, almost uh, a fall on an outstretched hand, if you would. That's associated at times with perilunate or lunate dislocations, and that's in 12 to 25 percent of your patients with triquetral body fractures. So be aware of these, and be aware to look for your galulous lines in your arcs of your, your carpal bones. Volar avulsion fractures of the triquetrum are also associated with lunotriquetral ligament injuries, and that, again, if undiagnosed, untreated, or not united, can lead to potential VC or volar intercalated segmental instability with volar rotation of the lunate. Trapezium fractures at the base of the thumb, they're commonly associated with metacarpal fractures or distal radius fractures. You can have a fracture of the trapezial ridge, and that's basically that little area that crosses over the flexor carpi radialis tendon towards, towards a volar approach where the FCR dives deep to get to its insertion point. Displacement can yield to a painful nonunion. It can displace and narrow the contents of the carpal tunnel, causing carpal tunnel syndrome or because it lies directly over the flexor carpi radialis, can lead to flexor carpi radialis tendonitis or ruptures of the FCR tendon. Trapezial body fractures tend to be due to axial loading through the metacarpal, and it can lead to subluxation of the thumb metacarpal, and as you try to fix these, they tend to have a lot of intra-body uh, comminution. So by placing screws across the trapezium, this can lead to overcompression, which can narrow your joint surface, and then eventually lead to post-traumatic osteoarthritis, which is a combination both of surge and technical error, as well as combination of uh, the initial traumatic injury to the cartilage. Trapezoid fractures are not as common. They're typically due to very large energy injuries, your MVA, your MVC, depending on how you want to say it these days, your motorcycle cla uh, crashes, your falls from heights. They're usually associated with index finger metacarpal dorsal dislocations, or on your lateral radiograph, you'll see that index finger dorsal ridge out the backside. You can have small dorsal pieces of the trapezoid that typically do not get a good blood supply, they do not heal, and they can result in AVN. And you can have larger pieces that result in metacarpal instability, but it's important to know that your index finger carpal metacarpal joint inserts onto this piece. So you can't just excise that larger piece with reckless abandon, as it will lead to instability of your index metacarpal with dorsal subluxation, pain with grip, pinch, or with general activities. Your capitate fracture, it's difficult to see at times. Transverse fractures that we see towards the base or at the mid-waist of the, the capitate are usually associated with transscaphoid, transcapitate, perilunate dislocations. The neck and head have a poor blood supply. The blood supply comes in from a dorsal to proximal direction. It may not heal, or it may take very long to heal. This can lead to overall capitate shortening as it tries to heal. This overloads the scaphotrapezial trapezoidal joint and the triquetral hamate joints, leading to degenerative change and post-traumatic arthritis. Hamate fractures, these tend to be the fractures that are associated with manual laborers, people that hit the ulnar aspect of their hand, your weekend golfers who hit that fat shot and take a divot out of hard ground, uh, which is me pretty much on every shot that I take. This is your attachment for your distal carpal tunnel ligament, your flexor digitorum minimi, your abductor digitorum minimi, your piezohamate ligament, and your hypothenar muscles. Your undiagnosed or unhealed hamate hook fractures can cause chronic pain in the ulnar palm. Because the sensory branch of the ulnar nerve is right there, it can lead into paresthesias localized to only the palmar or volar aspect of the ring and small finger. This differentiates that from cubital tunnel where you'll get dorsal involvement of the hand given the dorsal cutaneous branches is involved. But with the hamate hook fractures, that's already taken off, so it's really only volar involvement. Given the fact that your uh, ring and small finger flexor digitorum profundus tendons are also near the hook, you can get aggravation of these tendons, tendonitis of these tendons, weakened grip, and eventual rupture of the FDP to the ring and small. 29% of these hamate hook fractures will go on to avascular necrosis. These shear fractures of the hamate are typically associ or, uh, um, associated with dislocations of the ring and small finger metacarpals. They create axial carpal instability. As you try to load the hand or create power grip, you're going to find your metacarpal sublux off the backside and collapse on themselves. You can have a hamate dislocation, ulnar nerve injuries associated with these, 
compartment syndromes of the hand or hypothenar space, and avascular necrosis. And if you're counting, this is the eighth bone. Uh, so this is the pisiform, and this is, uh, you can certainly get pisiform fractures. That's our attachment for the piezohamate ligament and piezotriquetral ligaments, abductor digeni minimi and transcarpal ligament. With these, they have a high incidence of associated fractures to the distal radius and other carpal bones, so check for these. Your piezotriquetral joint incongruity, when it heals, tends to lead to pain and piezotriquetral joint arthritis. And since this is right next to the ulnar nerve, ulnar nerve injuries are certainly common with these fractures, uh, whether immediately upon presentation or late sequelae. Thank you very much.